Alright, so I think I will get started. Uh, this is the first half of what last year was a one hour presentation. I broke it into two. Oh, okay. uh, this will be the history portion. If you're here for candy, that will be coming a little later. So, right now we're just talking about how we got to the point where we're at right now in the candy world. Uh, unfortunately, as far as the history of candy goes, until the Industrial Revolution, there's not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, the Industrial Revolution has made it easier and to be widespread, mass produced, and everyone from the richest to the poorest can get their hands on it. Pretty much since the moment man stuck his finger in a beehive and put it in his mouth and said, hey, that tastes good, we've loved sweet stuff. Uh, honey was used mostly as a preservative. You know, with nuts and other ingredients that are put into recipes uh, such as baklava and you know, just traditional recipes like that. The other side that they used uh, sweetness for was to make the medicine go down. It's not just a wine and a salt. They did literally create cough drops with very harsh medicinal qualities that they sweetened with honey or you know syrups. Different locations had different types of sweetness. If you looked at the area that grew almonds, you had marzipan. You could just, yeah, I'm not fond of marzipan <laughs> myself. Uh, if you lived in an area that had fene seeds or fene wafers, it's a naturally sweet, like a sesame seed type thing. <coughs> Honey, I mentioned maple trees. Uh, you, you'll be surprised a lot of trees produce syrup, such as the maple or <coughs> any birch syrup. Uh, I don't know how oak syrup tastes, but it's probably not, not, not fun. Uh, mostly candy was, and they, and they didn't really call it candy back then. Candy is a word that the Americans came up with. It's based off of the, if I'm recalling correctly, it's the Turkish word Kandi, Q-A-N-D-I, which Americans then started calling this candy. Depending on where you were located, you would call things sweetmeats or drops, you know, that sort of nature. Now, when we get to the Industrial Revolution, bam, we've got machines. They can do everything for us. Sugar used to be a very time-consuming process to create sugar. And I do believe I'm talking fast again. Yes, we are only three minutes in, and I'm already at the Industrial Revolution. Shoot. Uh, sugar mass produced in quantities. Until the Industrial Revolution, unless you were very rich, you didn't have white table sugar. That was not a thing. Uh, you were lucky to get bricks of browner sugar. And even once the Industrial Revolution got underway, you probably didn't see the white sugar as often as you saw a brick of brown cane sugar. So, let's see. Yeah, that was uh, in the 18th to 19th century was when sugar went from being a luxury item to an everyday necessity. Um, mostly because of the growth of commodity chains. We start out with you know, the sugar farms, and they mass produce the sugars. And, uh, let's see. What? Did I have to do that. My laptop is skipping. <laughs> you have to love technology until you don't. <laughs> no, it makes life so does. much easier until it does not. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the Industrial Revolution, which you know helped us as a society make great leaps and bounds, it also did the same to the sugar industry. And uh, in the 19th century alone, uh, sugar boilers became a thing. They facilitated the move of sugar and resulting sweet sugar. By the 1840s, machines started allowing the mass production of good quality uniform and dependable sweets. That in a lot of places we'll call them sweets as opposed to candy. And by saying a good quality uniform, well, up until that point, you depended on handmade, homemade type things. And one person's batch of, say, caramel is going to be different from a second person's batch of caramel. Or even the same person's batch of caramel could be different depending on 
you know, at what point they're making and what ingredients they put into it. Now, with machines, you can control everything. You can totally control the temperature, you can control the amount you put into it, uh, you can start adding chemicals, to stabilize everything. So, uh, by being able to maintain the same quality throughout, you can go to a store and say, hey, I want this piece of lemon penny candy, and know it's going to taste like the piece of lemon penny candy you bought a month ago. And because of that, you know, people started depending on it. Let's see, I do actually have a quote from the Treatise on the Art of Boiling Sugar, written in 1864. Uh, the large increase in consumption of sweets has arisen principally from the cheapness and facility of manufacture derived from the introduction of machinery. And he goes on to talk about how 20 years prior to writing this, so in 1844, uh, it was no mean feat to prepare seven pounds of acid drops, which most likely was a little <coughs> very sharp and acidic. Twenty pounds, or seven pounds by hand, with the help of an assistant, uh, in the space of 30 minutes. However, at the time he was writing, that same assistant by himself, so someone not actually trained to make candy, could then make it seven pounds in only five minutes. So, I mean, this is a, a mammoth thing. So you can thank the Industrial Revolution for all the candy we now find on the shelves today. Uh, the United States, we really took off when a lozenge cutter was invented. Now, I mentioned earlier that cough drops was a very popular form of how candy kind of eventually developed. You, you, know, you took a cough drop, if you didn't sweeten it, it I don't know if you've ever had Ricola. Yeah, they, they're, they're bad on their own, but imagine them without any sweet. So that, that is pretty terrible. And until the lozenge cutter was invented and patented, uh, really you, you were cutting it by hand. And as I will be demonstrating later, because all of my candies are not yet cut, um, cutting by hand is not as easy as it would seem. So uh, Oliver R. Chase, in 1847, invented a machine that would cut everything out for you. And so th this kind of paved the way for other machines, as people saw this and said, hey, if this machine can cut it, what else can a machine do? So it kind of inspired a machine that spun sugar into fine threads which was invented in 1897, and we all know now is cotton candy. It was only introduced to the world in 1904, however. Uh, another machine invention, which was around the time, trademarked in 1931, but actually supposedly invented back in 1908. It does take the trademark process a little while to get officialized. They invented candy on the end of a stick, which we know is a lollipop. Or worldwide it's known as a lollipop, sometimes we'll call them suckers. Uh, to, to think that that wasn't really a wide known thing until after this machine in 1931. It, it <coughs> surprised to me, you would think putting something on a stick, at least as popular as it is today, by everything on a stick. But yeah, until they found a machine that could do it for you, you know, no, it, it wasn't as, as readily available. And then they went from there to machines that would wrap candies, which I love a machine that would wrap candy. Unfortunately, they are still high cost. Um, it is a very, very time consuming process to hand wrap candies. Uh, and that was around the turn of the century, which now allowed the companies to market towards children. Because if you can hand wrap a relatively cheap candy, it's going to cost a lot because you're hand wrapping it, you're spending a lot of time doing it. I can say that I can wrap a pound of caramels in about 15 minutes, and it's not actually a lot of caramels in a pound. So if it takes me 15 minutes and I'm doing that, I'm trying to wrap. You know, seven pounds of caramels, and I can't do math this early in the morning. In a lot of amount of time, paying a person to do that is expensive. Doing it in five minutes by machine, you're not paying the machine. So, 105 minutes, or 105 minutes. 
We have desserts, we have sweets. No, yeah, we, we have very nice desserts, but we don't really eat candy. We don't walk into a candy store unless we're a child at heart. You know, yeah, yeah, I did. That's what you're say. What adult doesn't eat candy? <laughs> yeah, well, you, you don't admit yes. to it. You know, adult, adults aren't going to sit there swapping stories about, you know, I, I bought you know six pounds of candy this weekend. And, oh, it was glorious. I ate all the one sitting at it. And stomach ache. <laughs> so sick, and man, the colors. No, they talk about alcohol that way. <laughs> yeah, this is this is very true. I can attest to that. Debbie. I was so drunk. <laughs> I knew I had a panel this morning, so I couldn't enjoy myself the way a lot of my peers were last night. However, moving back to the candy, yeah, that was when they could start marketing towards kids, and that's when things became more colorful. And you know they started naming things in funny ways. You know, you know, Snickers. You know that that's a probably not a very adult name. You, know, you <coughs> name your, your chocolate the giggles. If you were marketing towards grown people who are supposed to be mature and earning a paycheck. Oh, I'm not supposed to do things like So you know the whole notion of you know feeding your child sweets wasn't a thing until they were in the last years. So in a way, the where we've become in our society with <coughs> so many things aimed at children really came from that. When, when they saw how kids could get their own hands on candy and then influence their parents to give them more money, that's when they started seeing ways to market other things towards kids that you, they wouldn't otherwise be able to purchase. However, they could go after their parents and say, hey, can I get some money to buy that giant Hot Wheels track that I saw on the commercials? And things like that. So you can think, you can think candy sweets for you know, all the lovely commercials here. Kids hanging on your pants leg. Uh, by 1884, Chicago in the U.S. had become the main spot for candy businesses, and uh, they founded the National Confectioners Association. So even by the late 19th century, we were starting to form groups. Uh, the motivations were the same of uh, candy makers prior, hundreds of years, which was to set standards, uh, banish adulteration so that the products could be relied upon. If, you know, as I was saying, you know, liking to go purchase a lemon drop from a store and, you know, expecting to be the exact same lemon drop from, you know, a prior, not only was that a good thing for the companies, but it was a good thing for the stores because then they didn't get the customer complaints that, oh, this isn't the same lemon drop. So they realized that we need to band together to put in our own rules. We, we talk nowadays a lot about government regulations. Well, originally we were regulating ourselves because we saw it as a good business idea. You know, if, you, if you're not constantly screwing up your, your consumer, they're going to keep coming back and spending money with you. So they bounded together in 1884, and Chicago did become the hotbed in more ways than one. Uh, many candy companies have kind of come and gone as well as the products. Uh, Mars bars and branches still produce their wares. Uh, you can find milk duds, jelly bellies, Tootsie Rolls, they're all Chicago-based inventions. Uh, you still find them on the shelves today. Uh, some things you will find in different forms. There is, I want to say, 
I think it was the original Mars bar, which you cannot actually find as a Mars bar on the shelf, but Snickers with Lemons is the exact same product. Uh, you will find if, if you're really missing... Are you doing a head? Good morning. <laughs> I'm making count this one. Or are you trying to wake up? Hold it up. If, if, if you are missing something from your childhood, thanks to the glory of the internet today, you can look it up and find it somewhere. Uh, you can it. <laughs> <laughs> There's no guarantee that what you're finding was made back in your childhood. You may just have to have a huge batch of stuff in your mind. So you, you do have to be a little leery of who you're purchasing from. Uh, some companies are acting on the nostalgia idea because, you know, man, who wouldn't want to be a kid again? So they are finding the rights to the recipes, whether they can actually get the hands on the actual recipe or not, and starting to mass produce and put back in the If you go to Craft the Barrel, they have a large variety of things that you can only find. Hello. 20, 30, 40 years ago. And I talked too fast. Yeah. <laughs> so this is why I need a slideshow. It forces me to wait for things to load and you know, do your fancy animations. Uh, I don't know, sometimes last year you still talk too fast, but it's, you were like three ahead and had to like. <laughs> Uh, of this. You were here last year? Yes. Okay, so you do remember where it was all one. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I was saying in the history portion last year, while it was supposed to be half of the panel, while the being and is really everyone talks about candy, but you want to eat it. <laughs> I don't know, I have more fun talking about it. <laughs> My daughter and the next one on the other hand, probably have more fun with the other part of it. But. Talking about candy history or the candy maker? Yeah, actually, how many of you are going to, or planning on staying all the way through to Sweet Alchemy where we talk about the science of all the candy maker? Is, I, I can start that a, a little bit. Or we can eat some of the stuff that I was going to say, I'm going to be back for that one because my daughter and my nephew are on their way here. <laughs> well, got their passes. I have some caramels that will for a presentation last night. And uh, I, I promise they're still so good. They do have a slight amount of alcohol, so anyone who doesn't um, imbibe should keep that in mind. So, I, I'm not going to force anyone to eat something. Mm -hmm. yeah. these. I'm not going to talk about these because I will get started on the side <coughs> of the no, no. Uh, So if anyone's interested in trying caramels, I will certainly start cutting them in. Do a full-time presentation on how difficult it is to do this by hand <laughs> and why machinery is uh, such a great invention. It's a royal the toughest. I've got a chunk here. This is salted uh, crown royal maple finished bourbon <coughs> with a Himalayan pink salt on top. Now. As, as you can see, this batch, it's the exact same recipe only with the addition of the uh, Crown Royal Bourbon, which really doesn't cause that much of a coloration difference until you're cooking it. And as you can see, there's a definite color difference. Uh, the, the difference is in um, how, how it's prepared, how long you cook certain stages of it. But this is why commercially made things are you know, so much more popular. Uh, technically, had I added different alcohol, but cooked at the same amount of time, you get the same coloration differences. Using machines, it'll prevent those sort of differences. Not to mention the fact they often add uh, color after the fact to change it out. Now, they probably wouldn't be using a knife like this. They'd probably be using a large two-handed blade. <laughs> Right, and this is another, this particular batch is a little firmer than the previous one again because of the stages. And as you can see, cutting by hand is not 
Okay. If you would like some help, I'm more willing to help you if you like. Well, I've, I've got plenty of time, so. <laughs> Does anyone have, have any offer? questions about baby history? Do you have anything they've been wondering about? Do you happen to know when they first started to? I'm trying to figure out who decided that maple trees could make syrup. Uh, that probably, I would imagine, is uh, one of those things that, like I was struggling with the honey, someone just happened to notice, you know, there was a slash in a tree, it was weeping, some sort of substance. <coughs> and a lot of times when things are discovered, it's because someone watched an animal disappear. They probably watched bears or Okay, ice, birds or something, uh, and thought, hey, they can eat it. I wonder if it'll kill me. And <laughs> stuck their finger in their mouth and found out that it was pretty good. And over the process of elimination, they discovered the best way to get the sap out was to drill a hole, and stick a spigot in it, and just let it flow through there. But it, it most likely was someone noticed some animal scraping the tree or eating from a, a gash. Uh, maples, I believe, they're, they're very frequent. Yes. We're not eating, you're not eating that one. I do not trust the table to eat. Three times in a room. It'll be a little longer. If I die. Okay. Y'all can have my pet. Uh, they will once they leave. <laughs> <have this one. laughs> These caramels will uh, be a lot Okay, you know what? You're going to hear I put something in this. Yeah. <laughs> I can't eat them all. <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> okay, we got, we got a guard, guard barrier here. But they, they do soften up a lot once they get warm. The, the salt acts as a guidance system for your saliva. See, they're not breaking off like uh, any other questions? Comments? What, before corn syrup became the go-to, was it just a sugar syrup, or was there, were there other... Now, the interesting thing with corn syrup and other syrups of the type is that it's, it's a liquid sugar, and when you're making candy, you do need a liquid sugar in there. You can't just use the granulated. Um, I would imagine they used honey or you know, maple syrup or other syrups that naturally discovered. Um, to use a sugar syrup, you know, talking about cane sugar, was about as expensive as using the actual sugar. Um, corn syrup probably did a good thing for the research as far as you know, when that came about. But I imagine corn it became more of a thing when we discovered how easy it was to mass produce corn in the United States. And then we said, hey, corn kind of tastes sweet. Let's see if we can figure out what we can make out of it. I, uh, I saw a recipe and, and I bought I mean, in an early edition of Boston. Yeah, I do know that corn syrup, you know, despite the bad rap it's getting nowadays, has all, you know, it's been a very um, I'd imagine pretty much throughout the American portion of the Industrial Revolution, corn syrup was probably one of the first things they discovered how to do. Um, as Americans, we really like to be self-contained and able to do everything ourselves, and having the, the sugar plantations all the way down in you know, the Caribbean and those areas, that made it difficult for us to control our sugar intake, so we're going to go invent our own sugar. And if we make it out of corn, because we can grow fields and fields of corn, we probably would have made it out of wheat if we could have figured it out. But our wheat was making our bread, and our corn was making our candy. Did anyone else want some? Ooh, camels. Fancy little cups. Yeah, the boozy noise is the reason you got it. 
Oh, she knows you really well. <laughs> What's kind of problem? Well, <coughs> the other candies, as you can see, I've got a bag of marshmallows and a bag of caramels here. It became an adventure. How many of you are from the southern area? So the last couple weeks, you're quite aware of the weather we've been having. And I, I, was, I was trapped either at work <coughs> or with a lack of so, so some of the candies I was planning on making and bringing did not make it here for one reason or another. <coughs> but I made sure to bring Lucy cameras. <laughs> Kelly, do you people who would like cameras take them out to the others? This extra large one is really nice special. It goes with the same you know what, I'm going to cut one of the softer ones now, <laughs> because my hand is starting to hurt from pressing down on the knife. There's always also a difference in color. I mean, you can see there's a difference in color in all three of them. This, this is a salted rum. This is a salted whiskey, although technically bourbon and whiskey are, bourbon is whiskey. This is salted honey whiskey, and it's much softer. See it spreading in the pan. Oh, hello. second batch of these caramels that I made, um, they were too soft to cut immediately, so I put them in the fridge. I made the mistake of leaving them on the cutting board when I put them in the fridge. Uh -uh. So they came out of the fridge, and there was a line of, two lines that I had cut, and I'm trying to pry you know, off, off the board, and the entire thing flips up, except for the two narrow lines that were <laughs> and lands in the middle of the, 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 the dog bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sorry, no, no matter how you know comfortable you are with eating uh, flung foods, <laughs> I, I draw the line right there. So <laughs> the, <laughs> now remember, these are the salted whiskey made with Tennessee honey. Jack Daniels Tennessee honey, so these are different than the ones that you were just eating prior. These also have a different salt on them, but the salt's really, other than so I can tell them all apart, they don't have an effect. Did that first one have any alcohol in it? Yeah, the first one had the Jack Daniels Clare Dodge Royal Which, so the one thing with these particular candies, which, uh, I sampled at my Eat Your Drink panel last night, is when you have them <coughs> by themselves, it's kind of hard to tell. Like if you have one and then you have the other one several hours later, it's hard to tell the difference. But when you're eating them one after the other, you do detect a subtle variation. And that's because there's only two ounces of alcohol in the entire batch. And, they go good? and um, two ounces doesn't have effect. <coughs> Try. Do you have any that are not boozy? Um, yes, I do, and those are being saved for the next half. Okay. Good um, I, I keep avoiding the story because <coughs> I, I, I'm planning on spending a good portion of the next hour talking about adventures in candy making. But this batch was made in that room on various different uh, items that I could get my hands on and with a lack of a candy thermometer. Oh. So I'm very afraid of whether it turned out or not. However, we, we will definitely talk about that. Uh, these have no booze and I've made marshmallows which also have no booze. Yeah. Like and unfortunately they're not vegan friendly but they're all gluten free. <coughs> I do try to look out for people. I spent 10 years unable to eat beef or pork or any four-legged animal. I got sick off of something. 
and I understand what it was like to be on you know that side of the table where you're watching everyone eat delicious things, and since you're afraid it'll make you violently ill, you can't touch any of it. So I try to think about that. Um, I did have someone ask me last night about making vegan caramels, which I have not yet. In my searching on Google, found a recipe for that. Uh, Since milk is a yeah. major green. Just need to get milk some kind and of butter. Protein. Yeah. Uh, there are in a batch of these caramels. An entire cup of heavy whipping cream. <laughs> five tablespoons of butter. A cup and a half of granulated sugar. A quarter of a cup of orange syrup. Two ounces of alcohol. <laughs> and all the bread that sounds awesome. You said it was good. I didn't say it was good for you. <laughs> this is true. And this is why candy in moderation is a good thing. Unfortunately, when the Industrial Revolution hit and everyone could get mass one, well, that's when you, you know, wound up on tooth decay. The, the Dental Association was very happy about the industrialization of candy. <laughs> Well, quiet. So. Yeah. Quiet. Well, yeah. Yes, eat this and destroy your teeth so we can make money. No, that's not the <coughs> advertising we like to do. Um, I, I mentioned, I, I kept mentioning cough drops, another thing that became very popular but was actually a medicine type of peppermints. We all like eating candy canes and peppermints, and these little minty pillow thingies that you know, you're grandparents and their grandparents always had a bowl on their coffee table. Those are actually to aid an upset stomach. Peppermint will aid an upset stomach if, if you're feeling if you're feeling nauseated. Exit from the pay and exit from the restaurant. There's a bowl there's a bowl of them right there. Yes. Yeah, and then that that is exactly right. That um, between freshening your breath and uh, helping an upset stomach. Um, if, if you can tolerate the idea of something in your mouth, you are nauseated, having a peppermint will definitely help so. you nauseated. But like I said, you have to be able to tolerate putting something in your mouth. Sometimes at a certain point in your stomach ache, yeah. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing will go near there. It's also pretty good for regulating blood sugar if you're okay. Well, yes. Uh, now, the, the sugar itself or the peppermint? Because it is it is a concentrated quantity of sugar, and depending on what kind of candy you're eating, hard candies have a higher concentration of sugar in them. And again, I'm getting to the science part. Science but is fun. Science, oh, science is glorious. Mm -hmm. The the main reason I do these things and um, talk about them and make them fun is because I love understanding how things react and what's going on. And so, like, I know why the one batch is a different consistency from the other batches. And it does not necessarily have to do with coloration. I've had brick hard, really dark ones, and obviously brick hard, really light ones. The coloration comes from a completely different process in the case of this caramel, which is made in two separate pots. Uh, the caramel here, which has a very different coloration, it's very light, and um, don't mind the foam on top. I promise that is not indicating the to be concerned about. Hopefully, um, yeah, it's got a much lighter coloration because it's made in a different pattern. And marshmallows are just all together a different. Can you put that on the trash? Oh no! That, are you sure? It's <laughs> <I'm sitting laughs> really I was in this room last night. <coughs> So I know what was going as on. As long as somebody wiped it down at some point after about the pizza, it, it's got alcohol in it, they should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, in my eating your drink panel, I talked about uh, a lot of people think you cook all the alcohol out and you make something. That's not true. But as I mentioned, you know, two ounces of alcohol in this entire batch of candy, you probably get more from rinsing your mouth with mouthwash than people eating this, so I feel comfortable giving it to my friend because I'm more worried about the amount of sugar she's eating than the alcohol. Anyone else wants some? Uh,
Kevin. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you're at this. This is a much larger piece. That's nice. I haven't cut into it yet. Oh, it's on the top there. Oh, okay. That is black salt. Um, that's how I tell the difference between them. I use the black salt on the black rum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are very cool. So I'm going to select them outside. Does everyone just want to stand around and break all the pieces? Pass it on to you guys. Test your strength by pulling. Taffy? Uh, naturally, normally pulled by hand. Uh, the, the pulling process is a very big part of the When they invented the taffy machine, so that's when taffy went away from the coast. <coughs> where the yeah, taffy machine would do all the pulling, and that's reducing it for some time, as opposed to standing there pulling it and pretty much selling it directly to the Well, hello, we got little ones in the room. Need to watch my language. <laughs> yeah, actually, I've been very clean. I hope I haven't said anything inappropriate. I, I try to watch myself. Is she Rainbow Dash? She kind of does. She's got goggles and everything. Well, I'm really excited about my works. Now, these candies that I'm giving out uh, have alcohol in them. They have two ounces of alcohol in the entire batch. Uh, it probably cooks down about, I want to say, 65 percent of the alcohol. So we'll give you our final, let your children have some, we have some samples. I know you've had it before. So. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Well, you know, these ones are the salted whiskey. Oh, okay. The salted whiskey is not going to be too much these room in this pan. Yeah, yeah. I need a bigger cutting board. Is the whiteboard clean? Can you tell? Next year, I'm hoping to do a panel on gastromolecular molecular gastronomy. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh. if I do that, it's going to be a uh, there will be a slight fee involved because everyone will be able to take part, but the different components of molecular gastronomy are kind of expensive. So in order for everyone to be able to take part, this is a 98 cent rent from Walmart. I don't think, imagine that's helping matters. Anyway. Oh, there we go. Okay. Here's an interesting thing. One side of this. <laughs> Yay! Now I can get a proper equal I used to work in a deli. Oh, that's what I work in. And uh, I used to have food. Let's not cut my finger off. No. Especially not now that we have children in the audience. Scarred you for life. Oh, no. No. I remember doing a zombie where I said she was an infant. Uh, and she likes the body things of it, so she doesn't really care. In that case, I'll avoid getting blood on my laptop. There you go. There you go. Yeah. That makes yeah. more I'll sense. I'll avoid getting blood on my laptop. That's true, too. Mm -hmm. What's this extra protein? I mean, we already talked about it not being yep. vegan friendly. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of bone pay edition is not going to bring a Why are you embarrassing me? <laughs> oh, good. We only have 20 minutes left in this panel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the problem is, I think I can think of more topics to cover, and then I wind up getting up here and it's just kind of dull, and they all come out at once. And I have trouble remembering what it was I wanted to cover until I start talking about something completely different, and then like, oh, in addition, and add that in, like I did with the peppermints. Now, for those of you who are just joining in, we started talking about how candy really didn't become a thing until the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the <coughs> start of candy was mostly honey, which was used to preserve ingredients in different recipes, or to make medicine more palatable. There's no more shooting across the room. <laughs> she likes freebies. The one behind you. Um, are these really on the table of anything? These, these, I made a batch for 
upstate steampunk. We do have several different ones. So anyone who wants one, raise your hand, and she'll bring one. And I'll take them. Yeah, in upstate, I made. I attempted to make this particular recipe without the alcohol, and I don't know if it was the lack of alcohol or the lack of a decent thermometer that caused them to turn into toffee. Toffee, while it's delicious, harder. Yeah. is much harder. Yeah. Huh. And, and this is like borderline. It's breakable. Like yeah, it, that is the whiskey. There we go. It is breakable, it would not be cuttable. Um, yeah, the toffee well delicious was not what I was trying to make. But again, that, that's an example of how you know not not maintaining a uniform consistency in your product. Uh, that's the wrong. Yeah, not maintaining the proper you know, consistency in your product can <laughs> dismay and lose you your customership. Since I have just come in late and, and in the wrong place, I'm assuming what's on the top of that is a black salt. Correct. Yes. Sorry, sorry, people. No, that's <laughs> 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 fine. More I know you covered it. <laughs> I, just, I asked you. I kind of covered it briefly. The, I, I mostly, yeah, I mostly use the salts to tell them apart because obviously, otherwise, once you've made them, uh, you can't tell by coloration. Because I've had this batch turn out the same color as it's light. Yeah, the other it depends on how long you cook it. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, uh, yeah. I do caramelized gin, so I kind of know the, I do burnt sugar caramelizing. Yes. <laughs> and the color differentiation has to do with how long you cook the sugar. Candy shoot on the other side. Well, I'm cutting a smaller piece off. Yeah, you chopped it. Yeah, I'm going to cut it off. That's because it was like that. Okay. Smaller. But, to make you happy. There you go. Just block it. But yes, I used the salts as a difference. The black salt is black because of a slight bit of ash content. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, I find it tasty and I find it when I first yeah when I first started using the black salt <coughs> with the black rum because this is Jack Daniels black. Um, I made it around Black Friday. I have an Etsy shop where I sell my hair. And I, I made it around Black Friday. It was kind of like the big deal. You know, here's my edition of Black Friday, brand new caramel in town. Um, well, I have a question. Yes. Um, I noticed that salted caramels are, are very um, popular these days. Is that a recent mm -hmm. invention? Because I only remember sweet caramels back um, into the 50s. It's not so much a recent invention as it is a recent marketing book. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find um, a lot of things kind of become more popular due to marketing. Someone discovers, hey, we haven't uh, popularized this recently. It's it's like you know, diet fats. Fat free used to be the big thing. Everything was labeled fat. -free. Then carbs were the key. And now everything is low carbs. Your know, trans fats were at you know, one point. And now it's all gluten. So it you know marketing plays a big part in how things are popular. The thing I found with the salty caramels is the salt activates your saliva, you know, your saliva glands, which then makes you a little more receptive to the sweet. So I uh, salt is a flavor in hand. Yes. So that's why a lot of times the salty sweet caramels are popular. Um, I've had some people tell me I use too much salt. I've had some people tell me I use too little salt. <laughs> and uh, all I can tell them is it's a personal preference and. I make them the way I make them. I also make them by hand, so as you can see, <coughs> this area is less salted than this area because when I tapped the spoon, a large chunk jumped out here, <laughs> and in the corners of the pan, they're even they're more difficult to get salted. So I can't control how my candies turn out like you can with Which is why the Industrial Revolution is such a great thing. I keep talking about the Industrial Revolution. It's really. None of us would be here today if it were not for that. 
At least not as we are. We all drove cars to get here, or rode planes, or... Fifteen minutes, come on now. <laughs> very bad sense of time. Uh, those of you who arrived, <laughs> more candy, more candy. Um, I, I would offer cake, but I don't know if there's any cake left. Um, those of you who arrived a little bit prior to the beginning probably heard my cell phone going off. And that's because generally if I have to be someplace, I have to have an alarm that goes off in 10 minute increments to remind me 10 minutes have passed because my sense of time will either be extremely long where I think it's been an hour but it's been 15 minutes or it'll be extremely short although it's been getting better I work in a television studio now <coughs> I have a great big clock coming down in front of you at all times you get a better sense of time Yeah. 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 This knife is not yeah. Yeah. made for well, you, you ever watch a show called Unwrapped? Yeah, I love Unwrapped. <laughs> <laughs> and they go you know, literally and, and to the point where you know, the company will let them. Because some of the machinery is very, very high secret. Well, apparently it can't be patented. This is true. Yeah. 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 You can't patent it. They can't patent it. Yeah. 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 So some, they're very some, secretive about them. Some things you cannot patent. Um, the the patent on the can cotton candy machine that I was talking about earlier is actually disputed because several other people claim to have invented the machine prior. And even though there is a patent on it, that doesn't stop people from making their own versions because they kind of you know, you spin around a centrifuge really really quickly. You put some basically it's what it's basically a, a heavy sugar syrup just spun in, spun in cool in air. You get, a lot of them will actually use a uh, like rock candy, rock, rock sugar. But I, either way, it, it melts a bit, forms the grams. They call it candy floss. It's always fun to watch, watch the machine making these things. Just chopping a whole butt, a whole sheet, and going on this. Like the, uh, like the whole sheet is a whole sheet. Yeah, it's kind of like that. It's like a whole sheet. Some of the you know, places that still you know, small <coughs> shops, and they yeah. you have, still have people in rolling candy. But they got that chopping machine in there. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, the chopping, between the chopping and the wrapping, um, I cannot tell you which one I dislike first. <laughs> Until I start using cellophane wrappers, when I originally started out using yeah, parchment paper that I had to cut by hand. <laughs> so, you know, I've had to cut out 40 pieces in, in small squares and then wrap them. So that used to be my least favorite part, but now that I'm using cellophane, uh, the cellophane I use is derived from trees, so it's completely you know, safe, biodegradable, no plastics getting involved in the food. But ever since I started using that, I don't mind so much the wrapping portion. It's, it's always the cutting, although when I'm at home, I have a small handled, it's, it's actually made for, I think, cheese, and I use that to go down, so I'm not pressing anything. I've nearly destroyed my hands, though, because it'll go through and dent the pan. Luckily, I don't do any actual baking in those pans. I just pour the caramel in. But yes, this is definitely an example of um, why machines are great. Uh, the, the reason why a lot of places will have a cutter but not a wrapper is because the wrappers are 
so pricey in comparison to how much time they're actually saving you. The companies do have to take into account, you know, how how much do you pay a person per hour per versus how much this machine will produce and how much you will then sell. So if a person can wrap, you know, I said 15 minutes, I can wrap uh, an entire batch. Um, if a person can wrap 160 candies an hour, and you're only selling, you know, 500 to 1,000 a day, you're not going to invest in a huge machine that can wrap them in, you know, five minutes because, you know, there's really You can sit and watch TV at night and do it by hand. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's more fun sometimes, too, is to sit there and watch people. If I thought to bring my cellophane wrappers downstairs, I was supposed to have cut these and wrapped them all individually prior to the convention, but, you know, thanks to the weather, well, remember in the old days, this was the sort of thing to get kids to do. That's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so here, do yes, this. That's why you have children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because they're all the dirty jobs. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe they're all the simple, all the simple menial jobs. Maybe things are more complicated. Well, I mean, that's why I have children, so they can take out the garbage and you know, <laughs> the things that I don't want to empty the dishwasher, the stuff I don't want to do. That's what. You know, parents and now I have grandchildren for them. You know. Unfortunately, we're all manning the dogs to take the garbage out. That's true. They just eat it. Yeah, right? They're actually just dogs and they'll eat it. Okay. I think we're going to encourage you guys to be here and close the crochet. We are close enough. That's awesome. It's time for sweet alchemy for our business. Science. Science. Let's go this way. Now, I meant to mention earlier, I and someone, some of you may have noticed, I didn't say anything about chocolate. Um, I'm covering candy. Chocolate will be talked about by another group, and actually, immediately after Sweet Alchemy, they will be present. And I didn't want to be true with that territory, so I did not talk anything about chocolate. However, chocolate was very prevalent all throughout this time period. So if you're interested in finding out about chocolate, and um, I, I, I will go out on a limb and say tasting some chocolate, although I don't know if they'll be doing that um, shortly. Can you give me a dedicated chocolate? Then stick around for that. But, Yes, candy. The way I find candy is by the Webster's de definition, which is crystallized sugar formed by boiling down sugar syrup or a confection made with sugar and other flavoring and filling or a piece of such confection or something that is pleasant or appealing in a light or frivolous way, like visual candy or arm candy. So. Yeah, and, and, and uh, as I say here in my little piece, uh, not talking about chocolate. I love chocolate. I cook with chocolate. I do not cook chocolate. And nowadays, it's becoming much easier to make chocolate from scratch at home, just because you can find kits that give you the cocoa beans and walk you through all the processes. But, oh, I'm starting to get into the chocolate territory. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is a little labor intensive, especially compared to um, <laughs> these are so tricky. And where is the dip? Oh, you're getting a lot of work. There's the bathroom. Yeah. Um, candy making can be very easy. It can be very difficult if you make it difficult, if you do not have the proper tools, of which I will pretty much say the only thing I consider a proper tool in candy making is a good thermometer. Um, but it is as difficult or as hard as you make it. Things such as Turkish Delight, uh, which is a very cornstarch heavy product and if you've never made it and you've never seen it being made, it is one of those things that as you're making it, it looks like everything's going fine. And then at one point, it, it, the description is that it will thicken. 
which is not at all very inducive to what it does, which is become an instantaneous gelatinous mass, which tries to flay itself out of your pot. <laughs> so, you know, candy making can be different. It can be very easy. With hard candies, you put sugar and syrup, and you cook it, and if you have a thermometer that works properly, it'll go off when you're done cooking it, add your flavor, you're done. And the hardest part is all the meat. Uh, let's see. Some of the differences in candy, really, when you're cooking with sugar, what you're doing is you're removing the water content. The more water you remove from it, the harder it will be. Which is why I, you know, I said some of these are harder because I know at a certain point I cooked it a little too long to a little too high of a temperature. And in candy making, two degrees makes a huge difference. Um, up or down. You start at 240 degrees is for thread. Uh, you're, you're not going to get anything that's going to pull it. It'll make a thread when you pull it through the air, but otherwise you wind up with a sauce. Uh, you've got 235 to 240 degrees will make a soft ball, which these caramels actually get up to the hard ball stage. But what that means is that when you drop it in cold water, it'll form a ball. When you go and pick it up out of the water, it flattens itself. Because it is, it, when cold, it is fine. When it starts getting warm, it becomes a saucy type mess. Um, <coughs> you've got your firm ball stage, which you drop in the water, forms a ball, you pull it out, it's still a ball, you squish it, it squishes. Uh, that is kind of between firm ball and hard ball is where you want the caramels to be. You want it to be soft enough to be able to cut and bite into, but you don't want it to be so soft that you know when you lift it up, it just kind of starts oozing in. Hard ball will cut more difficult, and when you, when you look at temperatures, I usually have my nice PowerPoint up that you know you can see every temperature. I don't have to read them out for you. Uh, they'll say like 235 to 240 is softball, 245 to 250 is firmball. So you've got a five degree leeway between softball and firmball in the player. However, going from firmball, 245 to 250, and hardball, 250 to 265, you see that there's really no wiggle room there. So it, it does not take long to go from perfect to not right. Uh, we're going to try this. This batch of caramel. When I come from Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, those of you who are local understand the weather problems we've been having, I spent all of Wednesday night making candies and other items for my presentations. Um, I ran out of sugar at one point, and unfortunately, since I was iced in, I did not have a way to go get more sugar. So I had to sacrifice hard candies. Normally I would sample cinnamon hard candies. Um, but I could not make them, I ran out of sugar. So you guys are stuck with sampling my caramels and my marshmallows. But these caramels were made here. Because in my rush to get out, while the snow and ice were melting, and before they refroze between you know, here and, and Atlanta, I forgot the batch of caramels I made for this presentation. I got a text message from another sister <coughs> saying, I'm going to wait to cut until I can just say, you forgot something, and I'm like, what did I forget? Crap. They were still in the fridge at home. So luckily, the directors of the etiquette and indulgence pack uh, track are amazing in trying to accommodate people and they said tell us what you need you can make it here I said okay I'll see if I can find a thermometer somewhere went up to Walmart right around the corner they had seven thermometers and not a single one was for candy candy thermometers go to a higher temperature than meat thermometers don't confuse the meat thermometer for candy thermometer <laughs> I, I, I did that one time, I was making cheese, and 
I used a candy thermometer that again reads differently. A candy thermometer will say 230 and a meat thermometer will say 375. I, I don't remember the exact difference between the two. But I went to make my cheese. I was trying to make mozzarella and I round up with ricotta because I couldn't dip way too hot. But anyway, so Walmart had seven different thermometers. They were all meat thermometers. Had to come back and kind of cross my fingers and hope I got it off the burner in time. On top of that, I only had a liquid measuring cup. Mm -hmm. I had one liquid measuring cup. I did not have a measuring spoon. <coughs> I was in such a hurry to get it off the burner because I was afraid I was overcooking it. I forgot to have the one. <laughs> so, and then we have this interest, very interesting burn. And on top of everything, I was using an induction burner, which for those who are not aware, uses the magic of the magnets to heat things. I've never used an induction burner in my life. So at one point, this heat started frothing up madly, and I had no idea if that was because of the induction burner or because I was doing something horribly wrong. And um, that's something else. I'm about to find out if, you know, this is even cuddle. So, everyone hold your breath. Oh, God, it is not. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, that probably, it, it's bending though, so that's a good sign. Uh -huh. Can you crack it? Maybe she said, maybe you put the knife down while you're yeah. 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 I just imagine you slipping off the caramel and, yeah. whoops. But yeah, so this is a lesson in why you want to make sure you have everything you need. You are not running around at the last minute trying to put everything together. You're not using equipment you are not familiar with, and you have a good thermometer. If nothing else, I mean, if I had the thermometer, I would have been perfectly well. I also didn't have my cooking spray, so I had butter in my hand. And I I don't think I used enough butter. Yeah, it's definitely sticking with um, Whenever you're making candy, they tell you to grease it. I recommend greasing it extra in the center because when you start pouring it in, it hits the center. It's going to be hot as the dickens when you first pour it, and um, it's going to obliterate all that. Like so, what's bending? <laughs> As you can see, it is sticking highly to the center. This is, this is not attractive at all. I would not blame any of you if you don't want to try it. <laughs> it's candy, I'll try it. The other thing is I'm, I'm trying to stay away from that cutting board because it is covered with salt. This, this is just plain. The, the foam remains from probably from it being an induction burner. <coughs> milk fats, um, as, as I commented during the history panel, it, it's not anything you wouldn't want to eat. But also, as I said earlier, the main difference is even if you screw up something with candy, unless you really screw it up, like say you leave your uh, sugar on to cook so long that it starts burning, you'll still be able to eat it. I was making cinnamon hard candy. Cooked the sugar just a tiny tad too long and wound up with what tasted like toasted marshmallow. So it was still good. It wasn't sitting hard candy, but. Marshmallow. Oh, yeah, that's killing. Yay! I also have a package individually wrapped commercial craft caramels. So you can try, you know, the standard, every piece is going to taste like every other piece. Um, what are their remains? They use corn syrup, sugar, skim milk, <laughs> palm oil, whey from milk, salt, artificial and natural flavor, and soy milk. So it contains milk and soy. But these use heavy looking cream, sugar, <coughs> okay, those who are still mm -hmm. away from me. Sharp side away from me. What I'll 
I'll do is I'll put a wrap here and then the other pair of wash Now they smell better, you know. <laughs> no butter. But no butter in it, that, that's why they have natural and artificial flavor. They don't have to actually put the Definition of natural, natural flavor. It, yeah, it's anything. I that think it's, you can derive it from, if it's derived from an actual item. Item. It's natural flavor. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering what the material that we just have right now. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm sorry. Does it have any alcohol in the one? No, the one I'm cutting right now is a plain, simple, non-alcoholic here. Um, it is made in a single pot. The alcoholic version, you cook the alcohol separate from the sugar. Um, but yeah, this this is completely safe unless you are lactose intolerant. In which case, um, I am looking into a vegan friendly caramel. I have not found the recipe yet. There's got to be something out there because people, when they're told they can't have something, they want it more than anything. So. Much softer on top than it is close to the bottom. That may be the good one since we have a pretty good one. Yeah, and I have a better effect to the art pencils. 
Now the, the other thing is the store bought they are made so they'll melt easily. I don't know as far as homemade candies for melting them. Now I think it was bark still marketed as as melting as for use for making melted. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Candy apples. Uh, on the bag itself, there are caramel dipped apples and caramel pecan brownies. On the bag. Um, if, if you were going to caramel dip apples at home, I'd probably recommend making the caramel and then dipping them and not bothering the whole setting process until after you. Um, another reason that these caramels may taste different. The, these ones is with these caramels the sugar and corn syrup is cooked separately than the cream and butter and everything else. You cook that until it starts to darken and then you add the, the milk based products which you really need to watch out when you're adding the milk base to your sugar it will foam up. It will foam up a lot. So even if you're thinking, oh, I'm only using about two cups of liquid, go and go ahead and use a taller pan or pot. You, you cannot use two, well, you could use two big in a pot. Um, I'll amend that. But you, you, you can make a huge mess if you use too small a pot, and then everything foams up madly as it's trying to release its, its liquid, its water content. Yeah, the skeleton bread did a demonstration of that to show how much of mess it really would make. Yeah. Well, my comment about you can use too large of a pot. I attempted, I did attempt to make the hard candy. Um, I was going to make a half batch because I figured the full batch called for two cups of sugar, which I would not have had enough to make everything if I used two cups of sugar. However, if I used one cup of sugar, I would have just enough to make everything. So I was making a half batch in my usual pan. The thermometer did not go far enough into the liquid yeah. to correctly measure the temperature. So by the time it was starting to register that it was getting hot enough, it was actually burning. And the only reason I realized that was because I could smell it. Because the smell of burnt sugar is not something you will miss. Mm -hmm. Today I remember no. well from high school, the burnt sugar smell in the hallway from the violet from the chemistry uh, class. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I did attempt as best I could to make those hard candies. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, know, you, you have to make sure not only are you getting far enough in, but that you're not touching the bottom of the pot. Because if you touch the bottom of the pot, then it'll register as too hot. Too fast. Uh, is there anyone who has not yet had a chance to try the caramels? Who wanted to try the caramels? Oh, he does. Okay. Just wanted to check before I cut like seven. <coughs> In which case, we will pause the caramels for right now. We'll move on to something I don't have to cut anymore. Yay! Yay! Which is, uh, these are very fun to make. Very fun to make. Um, marshmallows. A marshmallow becomes a marshmallow because of the gelatin part. So you start out with sugar, as usual. Uh, you boil it down, and then you add it to gelatin, and you start whipping it just better. And you whip it good. And once you have whipped it well enough, it um, becomes fluffy, and you have a marshmallow. And the reason it does this is the gelatin <coughs> As it starts to firm up with the addition of the sugar, we'll get air introduced to it from the whipping action. And as it gets air introduced to it, it becomes bigger. And it firms up around the tiny little air bubbles that are being built inside of it. And it retains its height. <coughs> sort of like whipped cream, but whipped cream will eventually collapse. Marshmallows will not collapse. Powdered sugar and cornstarch, your best friend when it comes to marshmallows. They tell you to dust the pan thoroughly, believe them. <laughs> Put your entire 
whatever mix of <coughs> powdered sugar in that pan, shake it all around. If you think you've got enough, keep going. Add some more. Add some more. Uh, I made the mistake the very first time I made marshmallows. I did not starch the pan enough. I wound up having to sit there doing a gentle little finger motion to roll it out of the pan. Because you don't want to just pull, you'll tear your marshmallow. Now, for those of you who were here last year, the marshmallows I made were probably about, they were flat. They were, yeah, they were about two thirds, <laughs> at least, the height of these. These I made with the same <coughs> mixture. Last year I made them, and I wanted to make them in such a way that I knew everyone would have all of the materials necessary to make them at home. So I used a hand mixture, which turned out to have decent enough marshmallows but they did not have the proper height because they were not wet fast enough to introduce the air before the gelatin and the sugar started firming up. So as a result, they were much flatter. They were still delicious, everyone can attest. Mm -hmm. um, so using a standing mixer, definitely recommend it, but if you can't afford the $200 to buy a standing mixer, you can use a hand handheld electric mixer. I do not recommend using a rotary heater. I do not recommend that. <laughs> for anything. Or for, for anything, really, oh, well, yes. <laughs> and you can actually make mini marshmallows. So put your marshmallow content into a piping bag and pipe it, and then use a pair of scissors to get it Now, these may have a slightly firmer crust to them because I was letting them, they, they call it curing, you have to let them sit for 4 to 12 hours to cure before you can cut them. And then I got trapped at work much later than I expected thanks to the ice storm. And uh, by the time I got home they had cured very well on top. So, who still needs a marshmallow? Okay. Are really good. These are just Thank you. <laughs> um, someone last night asked me about making marshmallows with agar agar. And you can do it. It will be a much firmer, chewier marshmallow. It will also not melt. Agar agar, once it sets, will not melt. So as long as you're just, you, you want to eat it like this, that's fine. That's good. Uh, you want to put it in a in fruit salad, that's fine. You want to toast them as s'mores, I don't recommend using them. Right. You still want to the same concentration? Um, no, there were different concentrations. And actually, depending on the form of the gelatin you're using, that will also have different concentrations. Like, I use powder. If you were using sheets, you would have to use a different quantity. But, Thanks to the magic of the internet, pretty much anything you want to know about, you can find online. Which is where I discovered this key. I, like, I literally this morning said, hey, people were asking me about that last night. Let me see what I can find out so I can talk about it today. Went on Google. Within <coughs> five minutes, I had my answer. Because enough people out there decided to look into it. <coughs> And I will say now that if you guys want to take some with you, you're free and welcome. Because otherwise, they kind of sit around and have to get eaten by random people. Have you tried different flavors of marshmallows? Not yet. I had wanted to make. I was going to make a. I hadn't decided if I wanted to make cinnamon or strawberry pink marshmallows that I was going to cut into shapes and parts. Oh. In honor of Valentine's <laughs> Let me tell you, having a four-year-old in the kitchen <laughs> dissuades you from any notion of making more than one batch of anything. Yeah, more sugar, right? So, yeah, I, more sugar. Uh, well, she got the bright idea to ask my mother, her grandmother, if she could have a cup of mini marshmallows because then she wanted to trade with me. Marshmallow for marshmallow. Um, any, she's a sweet kid, but she wants to. Um, any 
any, any leverage I gained in using the standing mixer was offset by her presence. So, <laughs> marketing <laughs> is one of those things when it gets onto something, it's yeah. kind of there for a while. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I don't recommend taking your beater out at high mode. No. Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> I, I don't recommend um, leaving the guard on your bowl in such a manner that the back yeah. beater hits it on the way out oh. and knocks it into the bowl. Yeah. And I don't recommend trying to spoon things while you got a four-year-old trying to point out what you're doing. <laughs> so. <coughs> and what tells you to use to play with? <laughs> when, when it tells you to use a greased spatula to spread. Please, please use a grease spatula to spread. You will lose a good portion of your marshmallow otherwise. Which is fine when you have someone who's willing to lick the spatula. Like me. <laughs> I suspect a kitten like a is even more helpful than a four-year-old. Um, well, I wound up with marshmallow on my arms that I did not get all up until much later when I was able to get all shot. It makes you very popular. Oh, well, it makes you hopeful for something. The dumpers. Oh, my! <laughs> <laughs> we have cats. Um, some, some of these are flatter because they were towards the edges of the pan. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure you folks remember last year when they were very, very flat from the hand. Mm -hmm. Well, I used an actual stage. So, uh, they became nice and fluffy, is what it does best. Is it because the standing mixer does go to higher RPM? Yes, the standing mixer spins much faster. Mm -hmm. uh, higher RPMs, higher speeds. So it's got a very steady movement to it. Uh, due to the way it's set up, it will automatically spin the entire content. Yeah. If you're using a hand mixer, you kind of have to stand there for 15 <laughs> minutes doing like this. Do you like this? Do you like this? Getting distracted by the four-year-old and calling him what's spot too long. Oh, yeah. oh no, if, if the four-year-old had been present, I was trying to use a hand mixture, she would have been sent out of the kitchen. <coughs> she would have been she was. Um, the, well, the problem is I come from a very culinary-inspired family. We're the type of family that when we got iced in on Wednesday, we decided we were going to make chicken noodle soup from scratch because we had the ingredients on Sunday. And, it sounded, and then we decided we were making chocolate chip, peanut butter chip cookies from scratch because we had the ingredients on there. And then we decided what we wanted for dinner. And we made, uh, we took some leftover, we did um, stew beef chili the night before with big chunks of beef. No, no, it's real. Um, so we cooked it down until beef shredded and served that with tortillas and fried beans and some salsa. <coughs> And then we started talking about what we wanted to make for the weekend. So that's my family. We're constantly cooking, and the four-year-old is very much influenced with that. And she gets her step stool up. She's got a younger brother who'll be two in March, and he started pulling his step stool up to to help. Her. So yeah, when I was probably 22 or 23, I'm watching my niece try to help my father in doing carpentry. Oh, oh fine. And I had to say, Dad, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to apologize. <laughs> like, Dad, I'm sorry. I was there, too. <laughs> yeah, no, um, said niece, watch me. I, I'm also, I, I work in IT, and I work um, as an engineer at a television station, so I do a lot with computers and, and hardware. And my niece was watching me take apart a computer because I needed to replace processor on the motherboard, which for those of you who are not aware of that, it's, it's the tiny little piece inside the major computer. And um, she was watching me do this, and she's watching my screwdriver, and I look at her, and I can see her, she's putting two and two together on that thing can be used on other things. <laughs> and I said, okay, she's not watching me take anything apart ever again, because, you know, the next thing is she'll be behind the TV, trying to find the little people, and electrocuting herself, and my sister will hate me. So, the friend of ours tells a story about her, her 18 month old child trying to take apart the gas meter. No. <laughs> yeah, children are excellent. I made a mistake once of teaching my kid, like, I was saying, right, hi, Lefty Lucy. And yeah, uh -oh. I'm really good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's how these chairs come apart. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it was going off the doorknob. But fortunately, See, I, I just like to play uh, screwdriver. <laughs> you couldn't actually do anything. <laughs> but he's going to. No. So I believe you have like three years. Our fourth grade teacher, the most fourth grade when you went to teacher school, but I was just here hitting the laser. Let's see, what else do I want to talk about? The caramels I mentioned. These ones, two processes. Everything is as simple or as complicated as you make it. When uh, they were giving me the ingredients for making these caramels, the, the simple ones that I made in, on an induction burner, single ingredient. Uh, they came up to me and showed me a recipe and said, are these the ingredients you need? And this recipe probably called for about 12 different items. And I said, okay, well, I need these. I don't need all these. I don't need, you know, brown sugar in addition to the white sugar. I don't need baking soda. I don't need, you know, this, this, and this. All I need, heavy whipping cream. And yeah, I think this recipe called for milk. Uh, you know, full fatted stuff, please. Um, heavy whipping cream granulated sugar, corn syrup, because as I was mentioning to others, and I'm going to reiterate because we've got new people in here, when you make candy, you always want a liquid sugar in with your granulated sugar. Um, <coughs> portions will differ depending on the texture of the resulting candy that you want. Um, but the reason you want it is if you make something with granulated sugar and no liquid sugar, the granulated sugar will recrystallize once you get done. So, you know, it's, it's just how sugar works on science. Uh, if you've ever made rock candy, you know, where you put a bunch of sugar into some water and then you put a string in there and it all forms around the, the string, it's the same process. So you use the liquid sugar to help it keep from recrystallizing. <coughs> when I say that the amount of liquid sugar you put in there uh, determines the texture of the candy, um, if you use less liquid sugar when making something like a hard candy, because you do kind of want that slight fracture. Um, if you were going to make a sheet of, I, I've seen this recipe for the last few months, uh, the kind of crystal meth that you see on Breaking Bad, where it's a <coughs> sheet of blue sugar rock candy, you're going to lose a, use a slight amount of uh, corn syrup just to keep it from completely splintering away, but you still want it to have some form of crystallization. Uh, they found in experimenting in machinery, the, I, I want to say it's an 85 to 15 percent, 85 granulated to 15 percent corn will give you the perfect consistency for candy making. Too much corn syrup it starts to get kind of yummy, which um, if, if you like yummies, it's not a terrible thing. But if you don't care for gummies, then you know you don't want that. Let's see what else. Last year, I had people asking me about sugar-free candy. Um, depending on what you mean by sugar-free, is you know what's going to decide whether or not you can do it at home. If you're talking about those you know lovely sugar-free, say, gummy bears that you buy that have no carbs in them. Uh, don't try to make those kinds of things at home. You wind up using so many chemicals to make a no-carb candy that you may as well just bought it off the shelf. Well, I asked the company here that you buy fudge from. Mm -hmm. It makes fudge. And they used to have a line of sugar Yeah, that's pretty much it. Just Sugar alcohol. And they quit doing it and they said it's because they had to throw away about every other batch because it would, it would not come out right. Yeah. Because I mean they made they made but sugar free fudge that had the exact same mouthfeel, the consistency and the taste was exactly the same sugar fudge. Is that it's crystallizing up too fast and they have to throw badges of it away because it makes it very Yeah, it's very tricky to, to, to play with. And a lot of those sugar alcohols, uh, for those of you who you know, have never Googled the reviews for sugar-free gummy bears. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Stay away from xylitol. Yes, uh, it, they, they do not have a pleasing effect on your internal system. Yes, um, in that your internal system wants to be your external system. <laughs> um, the, the problem, I think, is that they taste too good. So whereas you should probably eat like two or three, you wind up eating two or three handfuls. Well, that's usually what, if you read most of the reviews, it's what I had. The entire bag. Fifteen or twenty of them in one sitting. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, it was the best I've ever had for Yeah, I, uh, I made the mistake of I was doing the whole Atkins thing and I thought sugar free gummy bears and broke into the bag on the way home from the store. And luckily, I wasn't driving. Although, maybe we would have gotten to much quicker had I been driving. But uh, I, I got into the bag on the way home and I ate a couple. I was like, wow, these things are really good. <laughs> that was gone, and you know we hit the front of the road to get to my house, and I'm kind of doing this number in the seat. I'm like, oh, dear God, if you let me get into the house without an accident, you know, I'll do whatever needs to be done. <laughs> Drive faster. So, uh, recommend. Find the bumps. Yeah. <laughs> there, there are reasons why you have to have a car. I found uh, the, the xylitol, which is what they use in those gummy bears. Is a lot worse than say malatol, 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 or such. It depends on the sugar, the, the sugar, alcohol they use. It, yeah, it does. And um, uh, there is a reason why they say natural is best. Uh, I find. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of lean away from the things that may be TMI right now. Uh, the other side of the coin to make sugar-free candies is doing things with fruit. No, no added sugar. You can actually make candy using only fruit with no additional sugar to it. Uh, you just will want to lean more towards jelly candies, <coughs> yummy type candies, um, than hard candies. You do need the sugar to crystallize properly to make a hard candy. So you're not going to want to, well, you'll wind up with more soft jelly candies. And actually, most jelly candies you'll find in the recipes are basically get a ton of fruit and cook it until it's thick. And that, that becomes your candy. Oh, we got gentlemen sneaking in. Thank you. Talk to Evan. There's some marshmallows. Yeah, there are, there are marshmallows. There are actually, these are the rum caramels. I have a picture of these standard caramels. Can I try a marshmallow? Or are you here for the chocolate presentation? Just kind of raise your hands and show them. Oh, sweet alchemy, yes. I forgot to mention, and I hope I have enough. I do have pins. I recently got a uh, button press and I started making pins and there's one that says Sweet Alchemy and it's got a photo of the caramels that I made in the background. So if anyone wants a pin, feel free to... I actually think someone's actually been in here. <laughs> feel free to come get a pin. Because I forgot I made the Sweet Alchemy. Last year I did a narrative on candy which was mm -hmm. both the history and the science hall for the pin. Uh, this year they asked me to do multiple hours of content. Mm -hmm. Hasn't worked out so far, <laughs> but it, it results in a lot of Q and A. I love answering questions, and if I don't know the answer off the top of my head, I can usually stand here for a minute or two and rationalize it out. Let's see, what else was I asked about? I was asked about the little things yesterday. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments? Just how much? How much? It really, it just should, it it, yeah, it, in most candies gluten. you're not going to find gluten, it will. but uh, it, unless you're buying it, like, oh. saying, yeah, one thing you, I, yeah, you, you find have to be careful about is caramel coloring, it usually comes weirdly enough for flour. Yeah, uh -huh. lots of candy. Okay. Yeah, I would say when you're, when you're buying them from the store, you have to be careful, because you have no idea what they're putting into them. When you're making them at home, chances are pretty good, although I will admit there have been a couple of times I've almost grabbed, um, they make a cooking spray with flour added to it for yeah. when you're baking. I've almost grabbed that to spray it on my hands. Yeah. So I've, I've yet, I've not done it yet, but if I were to do that, I'd probably wind up not giving them to people that I don't know on the off chance that. Um, I do work with a celiac, so he has an intense reaction to gluten, and I understand that you know, not everyone's doing it because it's the fun of that. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm real sensitive to making sure I don't actually you know, know somebody you something they see don't this, want. See, if you go in the grocery store, it's like it's a fad now. You see stuff gluten free that. Right. You see cooking oil. It says gluten free. Yeah. Now, with some of those, there is a legitimate yeah, my, my reason to label because yeah. cross contamination yeah. issues, but. Yeah. 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 But I've seen like Nestle, like. Make jokes about gluten free bananas all the time. I've seen like Nestle bottled <laughs> water like gluten free. <laughs> 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 Well, it works out for you. They can charge more if they say it's gluten free. Yeah, yeah that, that, that is the case. Oh, and it works out for yeah. those who have a legitimate issue. Oh, it's yeah. now all this stuff has come out mm -hmm. to be gluten Yeah, previously it wasn't, wasn't labeled that it was Russian yeah. roulette. Yeah. Yeah. Or am I going to get yeah. sick or not? Well, that and yeah. now you can find cake mixes at Walmart that are gluten free. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday they I made their a gluten free flour and their regular flour on the same shelf. Watch out. Yeah. 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 yeah, my friend has written strongly for letters multiple times. Yeah. Um, well, at some of the Walmarts I don't to, they've got an entire separate section. Yeah, she does. Except you can't find it. Well, that's the problem. That's the problem with oh, some of these. Especially foods, they take them off the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're going. And then we'll move them from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. Move it around. And somebody, as there was a special one, it's kind of off the all on the subject, but there was a special on one of the news shows where they talked about shelf space in the grocery store. And the shelf space and shelf positioning for a product in the grocery store is determined by how much the company pays in the grocery store. It's all marketing. That's why all the kids' stuff and everything. All the kids' stuff is down to kid time level or a reason. It's as I was talking about your history and all the world. <laughs> Once they realize how much they can actually s uh, sell things to children, uh, marketing to children became a huge thing. Because prior to, to um, penny candy and that sort of thing, you couldn't really sell to kids. Kids couldn't buy anything. And no one ever thought, well, the kids would get their parents to buy it. No one considered that as a major option. But once they saw how children could affect their parents to purchasing things, then they started marketing more high dollar items to the children in the expectation that they would then go after the yeah, parents. Yeah, and even those like your shelf, where, where you put it on the shelf. If you'll notice all the kitty cereals are in kid eye level. Mm -hmm. Mom takes the kids shopping with her because she just... Kid in the cart in the cart level. Yeah, kid in the cart, yeah, the cart, the cart level. level. That's where all of the, that's like the general mills. Well, they are running a business. Oh, on the toilet. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and it's really clever how they do it. There's a whole science to how they lay out a grocery store. Everything mm -hmm. is science. It's science. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, Granted, some of it's rather soft, fuzzy science, but it is science. I made a jelly mm. using red wine. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it's delicious. Oh, oh yeah. Entire so bottle of red wine, a uh, bunch of sugar, pectin. Pectin mm -hmm. is light gelatin only. It, it firms in a different way. Uh, it, it remains spread, and it's derived from fruit, so it's not you don't have to worry about defending your vegan friends. Uh, and then just a tiny touch of lemon. Easy is uh, delicious. Thinking about trying to make it with more higher alcohol content mm -hmm. drinks, like bourbons or whiskeys. Uh, when I experiment with that, it'll be a question of how high of alcohol content can I go before it starts eating the pectins and setting products. Do you have to kill all of them? I purchased from a company called uh, One Screw Loops that have bourbon. Oh, like well, the, the question there is did they use all bourbon or did they cut it with something? And yeah, well, and well, what is, what is bourbon and it's bourbon and uh, belly onion. Yeah, it's a oh, finishing it's, sauce. It's, it's not for finishing sauce. Oh, okay. Like meat. You don't so, spread, so it's, don't it's not like a jelly. It's not a spread for it's your toast. It's a, it's a huh. jelly. So you can spread it over, say, Someone's a steak as a, as a finishing sauce. I yeah, want they, to put in my red wine jelly on. Yeah, one of the most interesting candies I ever ran across was from some neighbors of mine who were from Cyprus. They were Cypriot Greeks. And they would take um, the uh, grape juice from the stopping the grapes, add extra sugar to it, boil it in the big kettles, 
and then use the equipment that they would use for making candles and dip it and make kind of a fruit leather candle by layer after layer of this sweet uh, grape flavored syrup. And those were wine grapes. They were, I don't know, I mean, uh, I'm They're not a drink. I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. They, they were wine grapes, but they hadn't had a chance to eat. You're right. No, but I'm saying, but there are very different flavors of wine. But they tasted a lot like a fruit leather, but they were, um, but definitely grape flavor. More, and, more intense. Yeah. yeah. And, but the thing I thought was really cool is using the technique of candle making to dip layer after layer of... <laughs> and that would be why you need the extra sugar, Because they don't have as much of that. But, I mean, that is an example of how machinery or you know, a piece of equipment helped facilitate the making of uh, a, a popular treat. I'm sure in that particular area that they were getting the idea from, I, they, did you say they came from that area? They were from Cyprus, yeah. So they were from that area, and, and it became popular to them because they had everything on hand. It, candy on a stick, I you know, was saying during the history panel didn't really become popular until they were able to make a machine that could just mass produce a bunch of stuff on a stick. Because otherwise, you know, you got a guy standing there putting things on sticks and it didn't work out for us. But because they had something that could help them keep it going. So, yeah, that, 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 that is an interesting thing. And you can see where you know, you said like a fruit leather type consistency, a dehydrated as they and, it, and it was in layers, right? It's cylindrical tapered layers, you know, which is kind of like a candle. It, it does actually sound very delicious. Uh, it made me think about how a lot of sweets like baklava have the honey and the nuts mixed in together. Uh, originally, sweets were used as a way of preserving. Honey is, you know, could be a natural antibiotic, uh, antiseptic, preservative type item. So, you know, adding it to things helped it last longer than the days before refrigeration. Um, let's see, any other questions? Pretty much about anything cooking wise. <laughs> I'll talk about cooking all day long. That in mind. So we got 15 minutes. Or maybe 10, because I, I don't want to be in the way while the next chocolate presentation, which I did not talk about. I'll say and I, I samples. And, yeah, there's plenty of samples. Well, if they have samples, <coughs> I'll say the chocolate. I have no idea. I don't know. Um, I do know there will be chocolate at at least one of their presentations, but I don't know if there will be chocolate at that particular presentation. Because uh, I think that one's uh, how chocolate affected the age of reason. I believe is uh, the title of the presentation that comes on after me. And but I we try to steer away from topics about chocolate because I can actually talk about it quite a bit. But I will let the professionals do that just so I can hear later. Well, you know, you said this, and they said that. And I'm not professionally trained. I just kind of do things at home until I figure it out find something that tastes good. Oh, cool. Yeah. Like, uh, the Tur I talked about Turkish delight very briefly. I yeah, made some yeah. brought it in last year. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's a lot. I've never seen it made. <coughs> uh, everything I got was from the internet. Oh, wow. And, uh, oh, cool. yummy. Yeah. yeah. I found it. I found it on Wikipedia. Oh, you did find it. Oh! <laughs> Church <laughs> McKella? Yeah. Church, C-H-U-R-C-H. K-H-E-L-A, and apparently there's a variation that includes nuts and some flour, but the version I had was just pretty much still juice. Oh, yeah. Everything's good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. as I was saying, the Turkish light that I was making, I had to make it several different experimentation batches. Because they, they tell you it will begin at a certain point, and what they don't tell you is there is a fine line between when it starts to thicken 
and you're, you're like, okay, that looks like maybe it's thickening. Oh, dear God, it just gelatinized, and now it's jumping out at me. What is going on? <laughs> so, um, it's alive! <laughs> so there are, there are some things that, you know, while you're experimenting with, you have to keep in mind to be prepared for anything. Um, what, I, what I eventually brought in was relatively tasty. I'm not sure if it was actual Turkish delight as far as consistency went, because I've never had Turkish delight, which is another problem with trying to make something at home that you've never tried or had. You don't know what it's supposed to be like. <coughs> but as long as it's tasting good. Um, I will mention, though, if any of you ever tried to cook with rose water, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah start out with a quarter of whatever it is they told you. And then mm -hmm. if you find that you like that flavor, you can add more. Because oftentimes you'll find that um, it tastes kind of like soap. Yeah. You, so you associate the scent of roses with soaps, and it definitely tastes like roses. So, that was a very interesting. Thing. Yep, I just made a rotomel, and yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. You find that you want to go small on it, otherwise, you know, even with, with something like mead, people are like, well, that's really interesting. But I feel like I'm doing it. Uh, every family member I gave it to, I have, you know, several, I'm the oldest of five, so. There are many here. <laughs> yes. Um, she's the youngest. She, she's been influenced by a lot. But um, every single family member I gave it to took a bite and then looked at me like, okay, you're you're just pulled the cream on me. Have you? Like, not a single one of them actually enjoyed it. Several people at the convention enjoyed. It. Uh, which I guess I should find surprising because we do like different things here. Some weird people are I was kind of tempted to make that this year, and um, again, lack of time and ingredients and, and be patient to deal with anything that wasn't attempting to drive in a state where people have no idea how to drive. In. <laughs> but yeah. um, or lack of salt trucks or, or, or salt plows. Yeah, proper plows and that sort of thing. You know. Well, you know, you also, ice is ice. Ice is ice. Ice is ice. I, I don't care how Nobody often you say, <coughs> oh, yeah, I can drive an ice. I deal with cold. <coughs> no, no, that's not a good thing to do. Because, yeah, your, your car doesn't agree. My car has never been ice. <laughs> yeah, so the two weeks prior when we had some snow, I was fine with that. This time when we had snow and ice, I, um, in, in honor of uh, two weeks ago, I made a two-inch popper <laughs> <laughs> so, Oh! No, I was just, uh, if, if this okay. is real, I don't know, maybe some of the interest in the, how weather affects Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Weather has yes. helped. I had a nasty experience trying, community. To cook, trying to bake during the storm. <coughs> it helped a lot. <laughs> and uh, the alt altitude, humidity, uh, air temperature, all of that will affect pretty much anything science related. Like mm -hmm. cooking is different from baking, and that baking is very precise. Um, I almost consider candy <coughs> a completely different level of cooking because it is also very precise, but it is not baking. So anything that you are using precise measurements or precise temperatures like with candy making, um, you have to take into account the atmosphere around you. In the summer in South Carolina, it is humid as all the time. Certain candies will not set properly. Uh, it's 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 kind of why you know taffy is so great to seashore. If you try and make it in you know, Ohio, it could probably come out differently than if you're making it where the you know, layer is full of salt. Mm -hmm. um, how was your baking not during that? Um, um, was results. He was as making cookies. He was doing a shortbread, and it just you know, of course, you're with a shortbread, you're not supposed to handle it like more than the very minimum. But it just would not, you know, we kept adding butter and adding butter and adding butter, and 
it was safe. It needed basically about three times as much um, milk liquid because it was not, it was crumbled. And it's supposed to be somewhat crumbly, but I put it what was supposed to be there. And, you know, it wasn't squeezing. holding. Well, let me put you this way. I put it, put it together. Okay, that's fine. I got to roll it. I got to it. It's just everywhere. It's like, uh, it's probably the protein.